everyone get a chocolate, all of the kids? Wow, what a great verse. I might just read that again. Awesome. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. What an awesome thing for our kids to read um, and to be thinking about. So, a couple of quick community announcements. I think there might be... There we go. So we have prayer time on a Sunday morning at 9.30 if you want to come in the new location. So it's next to the chaos area. Um, I'm sure if you're not sure where that is, you can ask someone. On a Monday night at 5.30, there is a prayer time and dinner. Um, If you're interested in that and you wanted to know more about it, uh, go and find Andrew and Kath Glover and they will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, And there is the AGM on the 18th of October. So that is, there you go, there's the information for that. Sunday the 18th here at 12.30 following morning tea. So just stick around if you want to be involved with that. And I've been told that Simon Bain is a good person to talk to if you want to know more about that. Were there any other community announcements from anybody who wanted to jump in? Yes? Ah, if you want to go to Andrew and Kath's for lunch, you've got to get in quick, sign up. <laughs> Limited spots. Okay, great. Well, we're going to call the musicians up and sing a song for you. the 1.5 metre distancing that we're supposed to do. Um, yeah, so the first song we're singing, well, the first two, just mainly to to refocus our eyes on God. Um, just, yeah, the words for the first one are about God, how he is amazing, how he's awesome, who he is, and all, some of the things that he's done, and, yeah, and that he still loves us the same, even though he's amazing. So... Yeah, if we can all stand up and sing to our Lord, that would be great.
covers just how amazing God, that he's uncontainable, that he's placed the stars in the universe. And we know how big that is. It's just incredible. And he sees each one of us. He knows the depths of our hearts. He knows everything we think when we sit down, when we rise. And he loves us. And that is amazing. Yeah, I like telling my little son that he even knows how many hairs we have on our head. But he loves us deeply and that's beautiful. So here's another song just to, to refocus our eyes that no matter what's going on, that we will bless the Lord. We will bless him. Oh, our soul, whether we feel like it or not, we can pray the words, bless the Lord on my soul, or we can let them resound through our, through ourselves, Lord, that we will worship his holy name. And yeah, that no matter what's going on, we love our God and we will praise him. So let's sing.
lovely song, The Power of Your Love, that God's love transforms us and, yeah, let us sing this next song. Make us soar with him when we don't have any strength. That he, yeah, we will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not be faint. And we'll soar on wings like eagles. We can all take a seat. Um, we're just going to pray for the kids before they head out to chaos. No? Incorrect? Wrong? Sacked? Oh, you're on strike. Is there a union? (laughs) Okay. I don't know what my next step is then. Bible reading. Thank you, Paul. (laughs) 
That was our fault. We had that on the template chaos, so apologies, Taylor. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody, and uh, welcome those on the live stream. I noticed Tony's there, and also Jared is on the live stream. I'm not sure why his moniker is Beached Whale. Perhaps you could tell us about that later. Who knows? Uh, but welcome everyone on the live stream and here. I'm going to read some introductory uh, verses before we introduce um, Graham Herb. Herb, he's going to be speaking on 2 Peter chapter 1. If you want to open your Bible, um, I'll be reading the first chapter, or up to verse 11. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants in the divine nature. For this reason you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone who lacks these things is short-sighted and blind and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to confirm your call and election, for if you do this, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. They're the verses uh, we've asked Graham to consider. Graham is a Bible teacher of long standing and uh, is uh, still doing his work despite the COVID situation through electronic means. Uh, he's not a perfect man. We found last time that he doesn't wash his car enough. But we're willing to let that be put to one side. So I'll introduce Graham. Hopefully it will just uh, appear on the screen. Thank you. Good morning, church. It's lovely to see every single one of you here and I know that there are people home uh, streaming in and uh, watching the service and I've really prayed this morning that everyone would be blessed by God, not by blessed with anything that's done up the front here, but blessed by God. Now, I'm going to be reading out some passages of scripture today and they won't be appearing on the screen so I'm going to tell you where they come from so that you can either look it up in your Bible or on your phone or you can just listen to me as I read the scripture. I loved last week when Barry Townsend gave the message and if you're at home Barry because I can't see you there where you normally sit Thank you. Thank you for blessing me last week. One thing that Barry said was, listen up. Do you remember that? He said, listen up. I love that. And it reminds me of scripture when Jesus says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let's read God's word together. I was reading... In John chapter 3, and John chapter 3 talks about the interaction that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus? Very religious man, very religious man. And uh, he was a teacher in the Jewish religion. And I just uh, found that when I first became a Christian, uh, I knew I didn't want to be religious. I wasn't religious. I didn't like what religion looked like in the world. But at that point, I didn't know God. I didn't know Jesus Christ. And I thought religion was just a waste of time. 
and some religion is a waste of time. And it depends what you mean by religion, doesn't it? Because there are different definitions of religion. There is some good religion. Uh, but one of the definitions that I read in the dictionary of religion was a pursuit or interest followed with great devotion. A pursuit or interest followed with great devotion. Now, some of you might recognise the religion of football or the religion of Hollywood or the religion of popular music, and there are so many others. And others would recognise the definition of religion as being trying to be good enough for God, seeing if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. But that's not... Uh, what God cares about. I'm reminded of Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 19 where it says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. So we can try as, might, as we might, we can strive and we can follow an interest, we can pretend we're following God with great devotion in being good trying to make our good deeds outweigh our bad, but it counts for absolutely nothing. I want to read Luke chapter 22, and you can turn to Luke chapter 22 in your own Bibles, uh, reading from verse 7 through to 18. Luke chapter 22. Verse 7. It's not coming up, so I have to look it up again. Read along with me. This is Jesus before he went to the cross. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? Prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus and his, and his apostles reclined at the table. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. Verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, "This, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Please turn with me now to chapter 23 in that same book of Luke and reading from verse 26. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. This is the crucifixion of Jesus. As the soldiers led him away, they see Simon of Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus because Jesus was too weak. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come 
when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed, then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you today, You'll be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now it's certainly unusual for the sun to stop shining I wonder if you, would, if you don't understand the significance, to study for yourself the significance of the curtain of the temple being torn in two. Look it up. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. John chapter 19 you can turn with me. It's also on the crucifixion of Jesus. But there's some extra details given in John chapter 19. Let's read from verse 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, this is John, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Verse 28, later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, It is finished. 
He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. The work that he had come to do was now complete. Turn with me now back to Luke chapter 22. And verse 19, and then I want to pray. Luke chapter 22, and verse 19. This is Jesus before his crucifixion again. He introduced his disciples to this special feast, a feast that we're going to have right now. I hope you didn't come hungry because it's a very small feast. It's a reminder of a very important thing that Jesus has done for each one of us, for his church. Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new, new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. I'm sure there are people either at home uh, listening on the live stream or maybe even who have come in here today. And I am absolutely certain it's not a mistake or a coincidence that you're here today. It's important that you understand what Jesus has done for each one of us. Very important. It's the most important thing. It's the most important decision you will ever make to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I've read some verses which remind us that Jesus came to this earth for a purpose. He came to die. He did not come to condemn the world. God did not send his son into the world that the world might be condemned, but rather saved through him. That's why he came. We have an opportunity now for those that know and love Jesus to share in this meal together. It's bread symbolising his body given for us and also the cup which signifies, symbolises to us, reminds us of the precious shed blood of Jesus and we're going to take it in fond remembrance of him because we belong to him and we love him. If you're not there yet, if you can't say, I belong to him, I love him because he first loved me, then that's okay. Think about these things. Let the emblems, let the symbols pass by you if you are not part of the family of God, if you are not his child. Let's pray together giving thanks to him. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for our precious Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are willing to send him to be the saviour of the world, your precious, precious son, the son that you spent eternity past with. Thank you that the Lord Jesus was willing to come, that he was willing to endure the cross to take our sin, the punishment that we deserved, away. We thank you for your scripture, which promises that you will cast all of our sin and our wrongdoing and our offence before you into the depths of the sea, and our sins will be as far as the east is from the west. We thank you, Lord, that your promises are true. We have a hope and a future, and we want to gladly take this bread this morning in fond remembrance of you, of this great hope that we share in. And we also want to take the cup, which reminds us that your punishment 
the, the punishment that you endured was for our good. It was to rescue us from the penalty of our own sin. And so we take it, Lord, and we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If I could have a couple of helpers, please, with the emblems. Okay, I just got a message that I'm to go for it, and I'm going for it. Sorry about all that. We tried it out earlier this morning, and it worked well. Um, hopefully one day, as I was saying right at the beginning, I'll get to be with you in person, and you'll see that I'm more than a head, that I do have a body, so that's not too glamorous as well. Um, but it's great to be able to share God's word together. I know some of you pray for me, and I want to thank you so much for your prayers and for the work in Romania and Papua New Guinea that I'm involved with. Recently, the church sent me a gift, too, towards God's work. Thank you for, for that as well. I don't know about you. You're probably more spiritual than I am. But when I start reading the epistles, I usually skip over those first couple of verses, whether it's Peter or James or Paul or John. Those first couple of verses all seem to sound pretty much the same. Only the names really change. But I'm learning to do a bit more than that. I'm learning to pay a bit more attention to those first couple of verses, because in those first couple of verses, often we see things that tell us something about the character of the person, the writer himself. Often the first few words give us a clue as to why God got them to sit down and under the hand of the Holy Spirit, write what they wrote. And Peter's second letter is no exception. At the beginning of the chapter, verse 1, he introduces himself as Peter, not just any old Peter, but Simon Peter. He clearly identifies himself as the fisherman who became a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, there are some scholars who want to dispute that. And that's what scholars do. That's what they get paid for. But as you go through the letter in the next few weeks, it seems pretty clear that the one writing this letter had an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ with him. And we know that Peter walked and talked with our Lord Jesus. It's interesting, too, to see how Simon describes himself in that first verse. If I was Peter, I would be laying out all of my credentials, ones like I was with the Jesus, he gave me special instructions, I saw everything. But Peter didn't begin like that. Look at the way that he starts. He says, Simon Peter a servant of Jesus Christ. Peter had heard the Lord Jesus Christ himself say, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life to redeem many people. Peter, Peter understood, and it probably took him a while, that to be useful to God, to be like his Lord and his master, he needed to be a servant, a servant of God's people a servant of Christ Jesus, a servant of his church. He reminds us too that he's been given a work and he's been given the work of an apostle. Literally, that's one who's been sent out, an ambassador. When I first went to Romania, I had to send my passport off to, I think, Sydney to start off with and then to Canberra to the ambassador there. He'd been sent out by the Romanian government. He had every authority to say, yes, Graham, you can come to Romania. No, Graham you can't come. Peter was unique among a group of men who'd been sent out by our Lord Jesus Christ, commissioned by him to begin the New Testament church. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And Peter in verse, in verse 1 is quick to remind us that he was an apostle of Christ Jesus. The authority to do what he did for God came from the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one that was sending him out. He was an apostle, an ambassador, a servant of Christ Jesus. The second part of verse 1, Paul tells us, uh, Peter tells us who he's writing to. And he describes them as those who through the righteousness of God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Paul, uh, Peter's not writing to any particular church or particular group of Christians. He's writing to all who received it. Firstly, it was those in Asia Minor. And God, by his grace, has allowed us to receive it as well. So this letter is for us as well this morning. 
Peter reminds us firstly of God's righteousness. God is righteous. He always acts rightly. And it's through his righteousness, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of our Savior Jesus Christ, that all believers have received the gift of, gift of faith. His precious gift that Peter mentions here in verse 1. This precious gift that you and I have received when we came to our Lord Jesus Christ in repentance to God and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to make him the Savior and Lord of our life. Peter reminds us from the outset that this faith is a very precious faith that comes from God and from our Saviour. As Peter introduces himself in verse 2, he goes on to, let, to tell his readers what his great desire is for, for them and his prayer for them and for us as well. He wants us, he wants them to experience God's grace and God's peace. And he just doesn't want them to experience, he wants, the, it, they, he wants them to experience it in abundance, full up, overflowing in their lives and in our lives, in their circumstances and in our circumstances. And he tells us how we can experience God's abundant grace and peace. He says it comes through knowledge of God, knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. As you go through the book over these weeks, you'll see that uh, Peter uses the word knowledge, I think, at least 11 times, and because it's very important to him. But he wants us to understand right from the outset that we need to have the right kind of knowledge, not like the false teachers and the scoffers in the next two chapters. He says, as we have the right knowledge, we will experience with abundance God's grace and God's peace. In verse 3, Peter begins to tell us what's really on his heart why he's writing this letter. One of the things he wants us to clearly understand, one of the things that he wants us to know is that our Christian character, becoming a mature Christian, doesn't begin with our efforts. Sometimes I hear people say, Graham, I could never be a Christian. I'd never be strong enough to do that. Uh, I've got too many problems. I've got too many hang-ups. I wouldn't be able to keep up the standard." And you know what, when I hear people say that, I want to say congratulations. You've discovered a very important truth. You've understood what it means to be a Christian. As many of us who have been Christians for a while know by our daily experience, when we try to live the Christian life in our own power, in our own strength, we fail every time. We fall down every time. Peter wanted us to understand that Christian character, becoming a mature Christian, doesn't come with our own efforts. In verses 5 to 7, he's going to tell us the part that we do play in all of this. There is an effort that we need to make. But firstly, he wants us to understand this. God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. If I went around the room, your lounge room or wherever you are this morning, and I was to say to you, do you want to be to live a godly life? Do you want to live a life that reflects God's character? Do you want to live a life that pleases him? I'm sure all of us would say a big fat yes. Graham, sure, I'd like to live a godly life. If this is to happen, then Peter wants us to understand that the power to live a godly life, the power to live a life that pleases God that reflects his goodness, that reflects his glory in every nook and cranny of our lives. The power to do this comes from God himself. He says it's God's divine power that we need for a godly life. How can I get this divine power? How can I receive everything that I need to live the Christian life? Well, Peter goes on to tell us very clearly. He says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. Knowing God, our knowledge of God is the source of the power that gives us everything we need to live a godly life. It's obvious uh, that the knowledge that Peter is speaking of here is more than just a, a head knowledge, an intellectual knowledge of God. We can know God in our head. We can know all about God. We can know all about our Lord Jesus, that he was a historical figure, what he did. We can know all about his teachings, all about his claims to be Messiah, to be the Savior, to be the Lord of the universe. We can know all about God, our Savior, but not have the kind of knowledge that Peter is speaking of here, the kind of knowledge that God is talking about. 
the kind of knowledge that will change our lives, that will give us power to live godly lives. This kind of knowledge is an experiential knowledge, a knowledge of God that comes from experience with Jesus in our lives. It's only when our head knowledge moves down to our heart, affects every part of us, it's only as we experience him each day in a deep and intimate way in our life as we walk with him, it's only then that we can know his power. It's only as we walk with him each day and read his word that we can come to know God in the way that he wants us to. God wants us to know him. It's only then that we can only truly know God, receive everything that he has for us. Peter makes it clear too that knowing God is the only way that we can be fully equipped to live as God calls us to live, to live lives that are godly, pleasing to him. How does God call us? Well, he goes on to tell us that too. He tells us that he calls us by his own glory and goodness. Uh, the word glory here, his glory refers to the excellent, the perfect moral character of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are drawn to our Lord Jesus Christ because of his character, because of who he is. Not just his character, but we're drawn to the Lord Jesus. We're called according to his goodness. His goodness refers to everything that our Lord Jesus done. Everything he did was perfect. He reflected God's goodness. Jesus set the standard of what is good and what is glorious. And God calls us to follow his example, calls us to be the same as our Lord Jesus. And his divine power that he has given us gives us everything to live like Jesus. God has given everything we need to reflect his goodness, to reflect his glory in our lives. And the more that we know God, the more that we walk with him each day, the more, the more we will reflect his glory and his goodness. Peter goes on in verse four and he tells us that because of who our Lord Jesus is, because of his glory, because of his goodness, we've been given something of enormous worth by God. We've been given, he says, his very great and precious promises. I'm not sure how excited you get when someone makes a promise to you, probably like me, um, when people promise something, we're a bit skeptical. As someone said, probably a politician, promises are made to be broken. Sure, we've all had the experience. Um, we can think of examples of where people have said or promised something only for that promise to be broken, only for people not to keep their words. There are always consequences too, aren't there, of broken promises. We become less trusting. Our hearts are broken sometimes. If it involved our heart, the direction of our lives sometimes are changed when people don't keep their word. When a promise makes a promise, when a person makes a promise, we're trusting their truthfulness, their character to fulfill their promise. And many times, we sadly, we're, we're let down. That's why Peter could say that the promises that God makes to us are different. He says they are great promises. They are precious promises because they depend on the one who called us. I love that verse in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 that says, God is not a man that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he act? Does he promise and not fulfill? That's why God, God's promises are, as Peter says, great and precious promises. God is a promise keeper. He is true to his word. What he says, he will do. We can trust the promises of God. And what wonderful and precious promises we have. Promises like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Promises like, anyone who comes to me, Jesus says, I will never cast out. Promises like, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Promises like, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Promises like, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
great promises like my God shall supply all of your needs. And the list could go on and on and on, couldn't it? Because of the character of the one who has called us by his goodness and his glory, the promises of God are true. They are yes in Christ Jesus, Paul says. They are great promises. They are precious promises. They can be trusted. They will be fulfilled. They can be held onto. They can be believed. Our lives this week, our lives for eternity are safe and secure because, the very, because of the very great and precious promises of God. These promises, God can be trusted. Because God can be trusted and what he says he will do, he will do, Peter tells us two results of holding on to these very great and precious promises. Two, two results of appropriating or applying these promises of God to our lives. Peter says in verse 4, the second part, through our knowing Christ each day, through our experiential, experiential knowledge of him, through these great and precious promises, he has given us all that we need to live godly lives. And he says, if we use this knowledge rightly, two things will result. Firstly, he says in verse four, we'll participate in the divine nature. That sounds pretty sophisticated, but the more we come to know by experiencing the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives every day, the more we allow God's Holy Spirit who lives in us to lead us and control us and fill us as we believe, as we take hold of the promises of God, the more we become like the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we think as he thinks. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16 tells us that as believers, we can even have, we have the mind of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, Paul tells us that the more we contemplate, think about the Lord's glory, the glory that Peter's been speaking about in verse 3, the more we are going to be transformed into his image with increasing glory. The more that we come to know the Lord Jesus in our walk with him every day, the more we become like him, the more our character reflects his character. The second thing that results from holding on or living to the promises of God are that we escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires, Peter says. It's only through his divine power that God gives us. It's only as we know him by experience, walking with him, knowing his help day by day. It's only as we hold on to his very great and promise, promises, Peter says, that we can escape the corruption of this world. The world here is referring to everything around us that is opposed to God, everything around us that is contrary to God's character, everything that is opposed to his goodness and to his glory, that is opposed to the godly life that God desires from us. But God, again, through his very great and precious promises, because we are in Christ and he is in us, we participate in his divine nature and can escape the corruption caused by our evil desires. In verse 5, Peter goes on to describe the other side of the coin. In verses 3 and 4, he's made it very clear that God gives us everything we need to live godly lives through our experience, our knowledge of him. Now Peter wants us to understand um, that we have our part to play in becoming all that God wants us to be. While his divine power has been given to us and everything that we need to live godly lives is there, Paul tells us that there's something, Peter, sorry, tells us that there's, there's something to do on our part. There's an effort to be made by us. <clears throat> Peter says, firstly, make ed every effort to add to your faith goodness. When I think of the word add, I think of maths, and I was never a great math student, so it's not a positive thought. But adding is what we do usually do in maths. The word add here, as Peter is using it, suggests more the idea of support. We support the true faith that we have by bringing to our faith other characteristics that show that we have this true faith. We could think of these seven qualities of the Christian character as rungs on a ladder. We don't work on just one quality at a time, working up the ladder each rung at a time. 
Um, we work at all of them at the same time. For me and my simple mind, a simpler analogy is making a sponge cake, something I don't ever remember doing, but I know there are people in the church listening this morning or at home, who, particularly at Hope, who make excellent, beautiful sponges. But from what I gather, you get a, a bunch of ingredients and you add each of them to the mixing bowl and uh, to get the right result. Each of the ingredients that Peter mentions here is like that. They all need to, need to be added if we're going to get the righteous, the godly life that God desire. Peter exhorts us to make every effort to add to our faith, firstly, goodness. This ingredient we must work hard at, make every effort to live lives that are morally good. Our behavior needs to be modeled, uh, to be a model of excellence and goodness to those around us. This goodness that we are adding to our faith does not save us, only our Lord Jesus and faith in him that saves us. But this goodness that should be developing in our lives shows others that we belong to God. God wants to, us to be examples of goodness, both as good citizens of the kingdom of God and also citizens of the society in which we live. We are to make every effort to be models of goodness. Being those who are honest, who pay their taxes, for example, of being transparent in our relationships, giving no hint of evil. We are to make every effort to display goodness by being good to those in need, to those who are marginalized. Peter then goes on to say that, make every effort to add to your goodness, knowledge. Here, Peter probably is thinking actually about the word of God, knowing the scriptures and applying them to our lives. God doesn't want us to be spiritually ignorant, so he's given us his word to help us grow in our knowledge of him and as we apply this knowledge it becomes knowledge by experience peter adds another ingredient another rung to the ladder he says add to faith self-discipline self-discipline when it comes to our emotions our impulses our desires you know the areas of your life and I certainly know the areas of my life in which we struggle with self-control. But Peter wants us to be very sure that we need to be adding this ingredient to our life, making every effort to be developing and growing in our self-control. We need to learn to choose to make the right choice, to say no to the flesh in those moments of temptations, to say no to those areas that constantly try to control us. It's an effort. It's one that we work at each day. Peter goes on to say, add to self-control, perseverance. Perseverance means to stick with it, to endure. Perseverance is to practice self-control over time. Perseverance is to stick with it when life circumstances, when our situations are tough. Perseverance is keeping on, keeping on, even when it seems that everyone, even when it seems that everything is against us, we keep on going for God. Peter then says, add to perseverance, godliness. Our lives should reflect God's character. We should be coming more and more like him so that others can recognize that we are different, that we belong to a different master. And this difference is God and we're becoming like him. And the only uh, account for the difference in our lives could be him. Peter goes on and continues by saying, add to godliness, mutual affection. The idea here is that we are as part of God's family, as brothers and sisters together. We are to work hard at being, to, being connected together as members of a family, as a member of a family, a good family is. Loving each other, caring for each other, serving one, one another, having the same brotherly and sisterly affection for one another that we, we would expect in the closest of families. Peter, Peter goes one step further. And in verse 7, he says, not only are we to make every effort to have mutual affection for one another as brothers and sisters in God's family, we are to make every effort to love. We are to love everybody. It's hard enough to like some people, let alone love them. But love is a matter of our will. It's a matter of our choice, an effort that we must make, according to Peter. 
Hollywood uh, has turned love into just an emotion, hasn't it? Warm, gushy feelings that come and go just as easily. I've been in love in a few times in my life and it was nice. It was wonderful. I remember walking home from seeing my girlfriend and the stars twinkled in a new way. Um, it seemed that I was walking a meter above the ground. It seemed behind every bush there were violins playing. I was in love, or so I thought. The fact that I'm still single probably indicates that I wasn't experiencing the kind of love that Peter is speaking of here. Because God's kind of love is more than just emotion. When John says, for example, that God so loved the world, he's not saying that God had warm, mushy feelings for you and for me. His love was a very practical love, an act of his will. He showed his love by choosing to give us his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Charles Rory says that love is seeking God's best in the life of another person. And I like that definition. If everything I do towards you is to bring out God's best in you, then I'm loving you as God loves you and me. He gave us his best, that we might know his best, that we might be his best. Love is a, an act of the will, a choice. And Peter says, make every effort to add to all of these other qualities, love, love for everyone. In verse eight, Peter goes on to say, why we need to be possessing, making every effort to possess these qualities in increasing measures. He says, if we do these things, it will keep us from, firstly, being ineffective. Secondly, he says, if we do these things in increasing measure, it will keep us from being unproductive in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's possible for us to have God's divine power at our disposal. It's possible to have everything we need from God to live godly lives. It's possible, and we do have his great and precious promises. But unless we do our part, unless we make every effort to add to our faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection and love, then our Christian lives are going to be ineffective, Peter says. They're going to be unproductive, incomplete. Peter goes one step further in verse 9. He says, if we fail to develop these qualities, if we're not making every effort to do what God has asked of us, we are nearsighted, he says. We are blind. We've forgotten that we've been cleansed from our sins. How sad it is when we as Christians at times, we live powerless, ineffective, unproductive lives for Christ. We lose our heavenly perspective. We forget all that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter says in verse 10, he calls us to action, calls us again to make every effort to demonstrate by our actions that we've been called by God, that we've been chosen by God to be his sons and daughters. He appeals to us as brothers and sisters to show by the way that we live, the qualities that we're adding to our lives from verses five to seven, that we are growing in our lives, that we've heard his call, that we truly belong to him. Promise, Peter promises at the end of verse 10, if we do what God is asking us to do, if we stick with it, we will never stumble, he says, we won't fall. If we make every effort to live godly lives, adding to our faith goodness and knowledge and self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection and love, if we do these things, there is a wonderful promise. And this morning we're going to finish with this promise. When our time comes to leave this life, when we finish the work our Lord Jesus has given us to do, at the end of our earthly journey, Peter gives this promise. We will receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This is what awaits us if we live the life that God has called us to through his divine power. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this time that we've shared together in your word. We thank you that you've given us everything that we need to live lives that plead please you. Thank you for for gifts like your Holy Spirit who lives inside of each one of us if we put our faith and trust in you. 
He lives inside of us to give us the power that we need this week to live for you. He's given us, uh, you've given us your spirit to bring conviction in our lives when we're getting off the track, when we sin. Help us to listen this week to his voice, to be walking with him each day. Thank you too that you've given us your word, which shows us how to live our lives for you. And we know the blessing comes not from reading your word, but from doing your word. And so we pray this week, Lord, that you'd help us in our study of your word to see things that will help us each day, to put those things into practice, to know your blessing. Thank you that you, we can come to you each day this, this week and share with you what's on our hearts in prayer. As we're walking to work or school or doing whatever we're doing, we can just talk to you, knowing that you're listening, knowing that we can ask in confidence that you hear us and that you're going to do, according to your will, what we ask of you. Thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you that you've given us each other to encourage each other, to build each other up in our walk with you. We thank you too for those very precious and great promises that we've read about this morning. And we pray as we go out from here today that we would cling to you, that we'd hold on to your promises and the wonderful things you've given us to help us live lives to please you. Help us to be developing these qualities, to be adding them to our lives in increasing measure this week. We ask this for your glory, Lord Jesus. We ask it in your name. Amen. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. We got that sorted. What an awesome message um, that we just got to listen to. What was the last promise there? Thank you. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Is this working? <clears throat> you will receive a rich welcome to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's try that again. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah? Cool. I want to try something really quickly. Um, I work in a couple of schools, if you don't know, um, teaching kids to play brass instruments. And sometimes what you've got to do is you've got to try different things because people learn things different ways. And I just wanted to quickly, just some of the awesome things we had there, just teach them in a different way in case somebody sort of missed some of the awesome things there. So I'm going to ask rhetorical questions. I often do this with my kids. I'm going to ask you some rhetorical questions. And I go, what does rhetorical mean? And someone will go, it means don't answer. And then I ask them the question and one kid goes, Yes! And we all just turn and look at that kid and we go, let's try that again. What's a rhetorical question? So these are rhetorical. You don't have to answer. Is your life hard? Are you struggling? <laughs> Bless you. Are you happy? Are you excited? Do you have joy set before you? What are you looking forward to? Because it's quite awesome to read this. I think you need to not leave here until you grasp how awesome that is. Life's hard. We struggle. It's messy. We don't have a lot of hope sometimes. Sometimes your life, things get ripped away from you. Things fall apart. What's your hope? This one isn't rhetorical. What are you hoping for? A rich welcome. Where? To God's eternal kingdom. Who's welcoming you there? Jesus. And you will receive a rich welcome to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I hope you think about that this week. A lot of people go, as you said, oh, I can't live to be a Christian or it's too hard. It's worth it. You know, there's a verse that says, if you do these things, it builds perseverance and, perseverance and patience and you'll end up with faith of greater worth than gold. Greater worth. Your house, the things you enjoy, the things you're good at, your faith is of greater worth than gold. All the gold in the world means nothing because we're going to the eternal kingdom and I'm going to see you all there. I know I'm going to be pretty happy. I don't know about you. Yeah? 
No pain, no suffering. Joy forever. The eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour. We're going to sing our last song, Build My Life. So I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. And it says... I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. Are you awake? I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. Firm, strong, reliable, trustworthy. Yes? Can we sing this song on our feet like we mean it, please? Be saying in heaven, we will be saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We're going to be singing, worthy of every song that we could ever sing. So let's praise God from our hearts and from our mouths.
very much, everybody. Um, yeah, enjoy yourselves, and yeah, this was a lovely service. Morning tea. Please stay for morning tea. Have an awesome week. Jesus loves you.